Chapter 11 of The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins Volume 1 It is impossible to express my joy at the sight of day once more. I got on the land as soon as possible after my dismission from the cavern, and, kneeling on the ground, returned hearty thanks to God for my deliverance, begging, at the same time, grace to improve his mercies, and that I might continue under his protection whatever should hereafter befall me, and at last die on my native soil. I unloaded my vessel as well as I could, and hauled her up on the shore, and, turning her upside down, made her a covering for my arms and baggage. I then sat down to contemplate the place, and eat a most delightful meal on the grass, being quite a new thing to me. I walked over the greensward to the wood, with my gun in my hand, a brace of pistols in my girdle, and my cutlass hanging before me. But when I was just entering the wood, looking behind me and all around the plain, is it possible, says I, that so much art, for I did not then believe it was natural, could have been bestowed upon this place and no inhabitant in it? Here are neither buildings, huts, castle, nor any living creature to be seen. It cannot be, says I, that this place was made for nothing. I then went a considerable way into the wood, and inclined to have gone much farther, it being very beautiful, but on second thoughts judged it best to content myself at present with only looking out a safe retreat for that night, for however agreeable the place then seemed, darkness was at hand, when everything about me would have more or less of horror in it. The wood, at its first entrance, was composed of the most charming flowering shrubs that can be imagined each growing upon its own stem, at so convenient a distance from the other that you might fairly pass between them any way without the least incommodity. Behind them grew numberless trees, somewhat taller, of the greatest variety of shapes, forms, and verders the eye ever beheld, each also so far asunder as was necessary for the spreading of their several branches and the growth of their delicious fruits without a bush, briar, or shrub amongst them. Behind these, and still on the higher ground, grew an infinite number of very large, tall trees, much loftier than the former, but intermixed with some underwood, which grew thicker and closer the nearer you approached the rock. I made a shift to force my way through these as far as the rock, which rose as perpendicular as a regular building, having only here and there some crags and unevennesses. There was, I observed, a space all the way between the underwood and the rock, wide enough to drive a cart in, and indeed I thought it had been left for that purpose. I walked along this passage a good way, having tied a rag of the lining of my jacket at the place of my entrance, to know it again at my coming back, which I intended to be ere it grew dark. But I found so much pleasure in the walk, and surveying a small natural grotto which was in the rock, that the daylight forsook me unawares whereupon I resolved to put off my return unto the boat till next morning, and to take up my lodging for that night in the cave. I cut down a large bundle of underwood with my cutlass, sufficient to stop up the mouth of the grotto, and laying me down to rest, slept as sound as if I had been on board my ship, for I never had one hour's rest together since I shot the gulf till this. Nature indeed could not have supported itself thus long under much labor. But as I had nothing to do but only keep the middle stream, I began to be as used to guide myself in it with my eyes almost closed and my senses retired as a higgler is to drive his cart to market in his sleep. The next morning I awakened sweetly refreshed, and by the sign of my rag found the way again through the underwood to my boat. I raised that up a little, took out some bread and cheese, and having eat pretty heartily, laid me down to drink at the lake which looked as clear as crystal, expecting a most delicious draught. But I had forgot it brought me from the sea, and my first gulp almost poisoned me. This was a sore disappointment, for I knew my water cask was nigh emptied, and indeed, turning up my boat again, I drew out all that remained and drank it, for I was much athirst. However, I did not despair. I was now so used to God's providence, and had a sense of its operations so riveted in my mind, 
that though the vast lake of salt water was surrounded by an impenetrable rock or barrier of stone, I rested satisfied that I should rather find even that yield me a fresh and living stream than that I should perish for want of it. With this easy mind did I travel five or six miles on the side of the lake, and sometimes stepped into the wood and walked a little there, till I had gone almost half the diameter of the lake, which lay in a circular or rather an oval figure. I had then thoughts of walking back, to be near my boat and lodging, for fear I should be again benighted if I went much farther. But, considering I had come past no water, and possibly I might yet find some if I went quite round the lake, I rather chose to take up with a new lodging that night than to return, and I did not want for a supper, having brought out with me more bread and cheese than had served for dinner, the remainder of which was in the lining of my jacket. When it grew darkish I had some thoughts of eating, but I considered, as I was then neither very hungry nor dry, if I should eat it would but occasion drought, and I had nothing to allay that with. So I contented myself for that night to lay me down supperless. In the morning I set forward again upon my water search, and hoped to compass the whole lake that day. I had gone about seven miles more, when, at a little distance before me, I perceived a small hollow or cut in the grass from the wood to the lake. Thither I hasted with all speed, and blessed God for the supply of a fine fresh rill, which, distilling from several small clefts in the rock, had collected itself into one stream, and cut its way through the green sod to the lake. I lay down with infinite pleasure and swallowed a most cheerful draught of the precious liquid, and, sitting on the brink, made a good meal of what I had with me, and then drank again. I had now got five-sixths of the lake's circumference to go back again to my boat, for I did not suspect any passage over the cavern's mouth where I came into the lake, and I could not, without much trouble, consider that if I would have this water for a constant supply I must either come a long way for it or fixed my habitation near it. I was just going back again, revolving these uneasy thoughts in my breast, when this rose suddenly in my mind, that if I could possibly get over the mouth of the cavern, I should not have above three miles from my grotto to the water. Now, as I could not get home that night otherwise than by crossing it, and as, if I lost my labor, I should be but where I was, whereas if I should get over it I would very much shorten my journey, I resolved to try whether the thing was practicable, first, however, looking out for a resting place somewhere near my water, if I should meet with a disappointment. I then walked into the wood, where, meeting with no place of retreat to my liking, I went to my rill, and, taking another sup, determined not to leave that side of the lake till morning. But having some time to spare, I walked about two miles to view the inlet of the lake and was agreeably surprised, just over the mouth of the cavern, to see a large stone arch like a bridge, as if it had been cut out of the rock, quite across the opening. This cheered me vastly, and pushing over it, I found a path that brought me to my boat before night. I then went up to my grotto for the third night in this most delightful place, and the next morning, early, I launched my boat, and taking my water cask and a small dipping bucket with me, I rode away for the rill, and returned highly pleased with a sufficiency of water, whereof I carried a bucket and a copper kettle full up with me to the grotto. Indeed, it was not the least part of my satisfaction that I had this kettle with me, for though I was in hopes in my last voyage I should have come to some shore where I could have landed and enjoyed myself over some of my fish and for that reason had taken it, notwithstanding things did not turn out just as I had schemed. Yet my kettle proved the most useful piece of furniture I had. Having now acquainted myself with the circumstance of the lake, and settled a communication with my rill, I began to think of commencing housekeeper. In order thereunto, I set about removing my goods up to the grotto. By constant application, in a few days I had gotten all thither but my two great chests and a water cask, and how to drag or drive any of those to it I was entirely at a loss. My water cask was of the utmost importance to me, 
and I had thought sometimes of stopping it close and rolling it to the place. But the ascent through the wood to the grotto was so steep that besides the fear of staving it, which would have been an irreparable loss, I judged it impossible to accomplish it by my strength. So, with a good deal of discontent, I determined to remit both that and the chests to future consideration.' 